Kia ora katoa and welcome to this Business Boot Camp, the third in our series with the fourth finishing this Thursday. This series, session three, is all about the Agile workforce. My name is Mahi Tangaere and it is my pleasure to welcome to you to our session today on the challenge of an Agile workforce. We're very fortunate to have Chris Gagné of Agile Coach and Approach approach perfect to talk to you about our Agile workforce and what that is or what that could be. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Chris Garnier. Chris. Kia ora it's a uh, pleasure to join you today and as Mahi indicated I will be sharing uh, with you uh, challenges of a Agile workforce and adopting a Agile mindset. So just a little bit about me to get some context. Over the last five years, I've helped over 50 teams learn how to complete twice the work in half the time with 10 times the joy. Prior to that, I have about 10 and a half years of project, account, and product management experience. I am trained and practice in leading agile frameworks, such as Scrum, Kanban, Lean, I received my first advanced Scrum certification in 2011. I'm also trained and practiced in the dominant large-scale frameworks, including the scaled Agile framework and large-scale Scrum. I have coached Agile teams and organizations ranging in size from 39-person startups to a 39,000-person Fortune 100 company. I've had the joy of working alongside some of the brightest coaches in the industry during my tenure at Solutions IQ, which is the largest agile consultancy in the United States and now owned by Accenture, a half million person consulting company. With humility, I want to say that everything I know I've learned from my mentors, the teams that I've worked with, and the giants who push the state of agile forward. I am deeply indebted to them and I hope to share some of this with you now. So why this talk? Most transformations fail. 95% of transformations fail. And failures generally have the same root cause. Success is not even remotely guaranteed, but some failure modes are avoidable. And so it's my hope to reduce your odds of failure by disillusioning you from the idea that an agile transformation is even easy or even straightforward. Knowing this, I trust that you will approach the task with the humility, courage, and determination that it requires, and you will succeed brilliantly. In today's talk, we're going to be exploring four questions. What is Agile, really? What kind of problem are you solving? What is your theory of employee motivation and management? And what changes in an Agile transformation? So first, here is the official definition of Agile. Agile is the ability to create and respond to change. It is a way of dealing with and ultimately succeeding in an uncertain and turbulent environment. And this is from the Agile Alliance. This is the governing body for Agile software development. Therefore, Agile is a capability. It doesn't have a defined end. It is not a process. Most importantly, and I hear this a lot, Agile is not a project management methodology. If you hear or see someone using this term to describe Agile, it is a sure sign they do not understand it. Agile is something that we become rather than we do. It's a little bit like a martial art. You, you don't simply just throw punches and say, I'm a martial arts expert. It's something that you study. It's something that you create the path with every step and you learn to play. It is a capability that allows you to thrive in volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous situations. Unofficially, I'd argue that Agile goes beyond just being a, a capability. I think it's actually the very science of studying how knowledge workers can best work together. So I now want to help you understand what kind of problem you're solving. And as part of my campaign to disillusion you, I hope to disillusion you 
as to the nature of the problem you are solving. I'd like to introduce you to the Kinevin framework, pronounced Kinevin. It's a Welsh word. The literal translation is habitat or place, but it's a lot more holistic than that. It's the place of your multiple belongings, cultural, geographic, perhaps even spiritual. Kinevin is a sense-making model. It helps you understand what sort of problem you're facing and what the appropriate response and practice will be. In the natural world, they are chaotic, complex, and ordered systems. Kinevin differentiates between complicated and simple ordered systems. And in the center of this framework is disorder, which comes as a consequence of not understanding which space you're in. So let's look at each of these domains in turn and how we use them. So first, in the simple domain, cause and effect relationships exist, they are predictable, and they are repeatable. The relationship between cause and effect is evident to any reasonable person. And so in the simple domain, there's this action mode, which is sense, categorize, and respond. You sense the situation, categorize the situation to a known bucket, and respond with a well-known solution. As a result, there is often a single best practice which we can follow. This is like the game tic-tac-toe. Once you learn the basic strategy, you cannot lose. You can always force a draw. In the complicated domain, which is still in this ordered space, cause and effect relationships still exist, but they are not immediately self-evident, at least not to everyone. Therefore, they require a degree of expertise. So the action mode in this case is sense, analyze, and respond. You sense the problem, analyze the problem, and respond with a plan. This is different from simple in which the second step is analyze and not categorize. This requires training, experience, and expertise. In the complicated domain, there are multiple ways of approaching the same problem. Therefore, we apply good practice without trying to claim that it is best practice. You don't want to come in arguing that your way is best practice because you'll just annoy people who have been equally successful with their own practices. This domain is a bit like chess. You can plan ahead, but at some point you will need to adapt your plan a little bit. And for those of you who come with a come in with a project management background, project management institute, whatnot, this is very much in the complicated domain. You can come up with this expert plan and it's really up to the team to follow the plan. Now I wanna introduce you to where it really starts getting interesting and juicy. Now we're in complex. And complex is a system without a priority causality. The cause and effect are only understandable in hindsight with unpredictable emergent outcomes. Notably, you will not truly understand the complexity of systems until they begin to fail and complex systems always fail. Failure is the system talking to you. So we want to listen to the failure. We want to listen to that data. It's not noise. It's the system talking to you. And so the action mode in a complex environment flips. We probe, sense, and respond. In the complicated space, we're going to sense, analyze, and respond. In the complex space, we probe, sense, respond. So we're going to probe with safe to fail experiments. Experiment, evaluate, experiment, evaluate, repeat, repeat. Unlike complicated situations, we're not looking for fail safe design. Then we're going to sense, we're gonna dive into the new and determine next steps. And then finally, we're going to respond by taking action by moving as much to the problem into the complicated domain wherever we can. This is emergent practice because everything we face is going to be novel. There are no good answers. We're creating the path of every step. We're solving wicked problems. Coming at this with an attitude of play is really quite useful. This is like the game of poker. Past experience is useful, but you have to ante up. 
you have to actively probe the system to discover what your next move is going to be. And then finally, chaotic systems. Chaotic systems, if entered intentionally, can be used for innovation. But most of the time, we fall into them accidentally. and We need to get out of this domain quickly. No cause and effect relationships can be determined, even in hindsight. The action mode here is act, sense, respond. So even more so than complex situations, we need to act, trust your instincts, get out of the immediate danger zone. Then, once you're out of the immediate danger zone, you're going to assess the situation and determine next steps. And then finally, you're going to take action to move your problem into another domain. We're in a space of totally novel practice. The knowledge that you've gained over your lifetime is only partially useful. And this is a lot like the game roulette or craps. Most of the time when you're in a chaotic situation, you're not going to win. So don't freeze, get out, or get hurt, or worse. So tying it all together, we've got disorder in the middle of this, which again is the space of not knowing which domain you're in. Unfortunately, most of us are in this space most of the time. Being in disorder is like approaching poker with a tic-tac-toe mindset. You underestimate the complexity of the situation that you're in, and you are bound to lose, though you might get lucky for a little while. The point of this framework is to teach us that depending on the space that we are in, we need to think and act differently. One size does not fit all. Unfortunately, we run the risk of assuming that the problem reflects our usual pattern of action. So for instance, if you're a bureaucrat, you might assume that all problems are failures of process, reflecting the simple domains perspective. If you're a deep expert, such as an accountant or project manager, you might think that the problems are due to a failure to fully analyze. That's the complicated domain. Military generals, emergency room doctors, seasoned lean leaders, they're operating in this complex domain. They're used to getting perspectives from lots of different backgrounds and getting a team together and saying, team, let's come up together and come up with the best solution. As Dave Snowden, creator of this Kinevin framework says, fascists love a crisis because it gives them opportunity to control and act as they see fit with total impunity. What I would like you to come away with is that the problems you are solving are almost certainly complex, at best complicated, and at worst chaotic. It is extremely unlikely that you are solving simple problems. And if you are, you face an existential threat from bigger players who can solve your problem with an efficiency of scale or disruptive technology, neither of which you can probably even imagine at the moment. I therefore believe that the root cause of failure or stunted success for most organizations is a failure to appreciate the complexity of the situation they face and tune their management style accordingly. Here's an example of this. Leaders have spent the earlier phase of their career as expert individual contributors. They've worked up the ranks by being experts in a complicated domain. Well, this works great for the complicated piece, and, and this suits the domain that they've been given. They've been broken off a piece of a complex problem, which has been made complicated. They've been confined to this, and so they've become experts of this complicated domain. But now that they have been promoted into a leadership role, their problems are now complex. They need to give up their expertise. They need to relinquish control and listen to their team when facing their broader complex problem. Failure to do so is disorder and inevitably leads to chaos. I want to tie this into what is your theory of employee behavior. A lot of leaders' behaviors are dictated by how they see their workforce. Theory X and theory Y are theories of human work motivation and management. They were created by Douglas McGregor, while he was working at the MIT Massachusetts Institute of Technology Sloan School of Management in the 1950s and developed further in the 1960s. 
Theory X and Y come from this mnemonic device. Theory X employees are crossing their arms in front of them, blocking off and avoiding work, while Theory Y employees raise their arms in a welcoming way. I want to give you a sense of some of these Theory X employee attitudes. They're motivated mainly by money and fears about job security. There's very little creativity, except when it comes to getting around the rules. They dislike work, find it boring, and will try to avoid it. They would rather be directed than accept responsibility, which they avoid. Finally, they must be forced or coerced to make the right effort. Let's contrast this to theory why employee attitudes. Under the right conditions, they're motivated by the desire to realize their own potential. They are highly creative creatures, but they're rarely recognized as such or given the opportunity to be. They recognize that they need to work and they're gonna do everything in their power to take an interest in it. They might even enjoy it. They will seek and accept responsibility under the right conditions. And lastly, they're going to direct themselves to a target that they accept. So let's tie this together. How do we reconcile the Kinesin framework and Theory X and Theory Y employee attitudes? Well, what we're going to do is look at this through the lens of two exemplary leaders, Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company and Konosuke Masashita of Panasonic. So here's Henry Ford. If Theory X in the simple and complicated domain management had a t-shirt, it would read, why is it that every time I ask for a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached? Another name for this is Taylorism or scientific management. Taylorism is a production system that divides the manufacturing process into small steps that reduce the degree of skills required to perform each activity. The aim of Taylorism is to increase productivity and to reduce training times to increase output levels. An example of this thinking might be managing someone in an egg production facility. They are tasked with washing an egg every three seconds with a daily goal of 3,500 eggs. If they meet this goal, they get a 10% bonus. The problem is simple enough that the work itself won't be inherently satisfying, and so we need to rely on extrinsic motivation. And yet, even with the simple example, it may well be that someone figures out a way of consistently washing an egg in two seconds so they can guarantee the daily bonus. Would Henry Ford listen to their suggestions and let them train others in their new technique in exchange for a solid one-time bonus? Or will they still hold on to their hubris and assume that they still have the right way and not listen to their employer's ideas? Even things that seem simple or complicated, there may be ways of improving. We still need to be willing to listen. I'd like to contrast this with Konosuke Masashita, the founder of Panasonic. He's not fond of Taylorism, but he's a great spokesperson for Theory Y and complex domain management. This is a long quote, but I was quite moved by it, and it sums up agile leadership beautifully. So let's give it a read. We will win and you will lose. You cannot do anything about it because your failure is an internal disease. Your companies are based on Taylor's principles. Worse, your heads are tailorized too. You firmly believe that sound management means executives on one side and workers on the other. On one side, men who think, and on the other, men who can only work. For you, management is the art of smoothly transferring the executive's ideas the workers' hands. We have passed the Taylor stage. We are aware that business has become terribly complex. Survival is very uncertain in an environment filled with risk, 
the unexpected and competition. Therefore, a company must have the constant commitment of the minds of all of its employees to survive. For us, management is the entire workforce's intellectual commitment at the service of the company. We know that the intelligence of a few technocrats, even very bright ones, have become totally inadequate to face these challenges. Only the intellects of all of the employees can permit a company to live with the ups and downs and the requirements of the new environments. Yes, we will win and you will lose because you are not able to read your minds of the obsolete Taylorisms that we've never had. Konosuke Masashita, founder of Panasonic, 1989, 31 years ago. And so thinking about this, think of some of the theory why characteristics like these. We are highly creative creatures, but we're rarely recognized as such or given the opportunity to be. We will direct ourselves towards a target we accept. Naturally, these employees will thrive at Panasonic. Remember what we learned from the Kinefin framework. When we're in a complex situation, we need everyone's perspective to thrive. Now, Konosuke was talking about complex, and he said this in 1989. Technology has moved a lot in 31 years. I looked at Panasonic's corporate history, and this VHS camcorder was probably the most complex product Panasonic made at the time of this quote. I'm willing to bet that the pro any problem you're attempting to solve now is orders of magnitude more complex. And there's a paradox in this, which is that almost all knowledge workers are capable of having either theory X or theory Y motivations. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you hold the belief that most workers behave with theory X motivations, motivating them with money or fear, limiting their autonomy, enforcing a course in your teams to make the right effort, you will wind up with only theory X behavior. People with a theory Y motivation will not tolerate your strategy for very long, and they will leave for organizations that can attract and retain theory Y talent. People with theory X motivations can't stay in theory Y organizations for very long. They're going to become your talent pool. Even primates innately exhibit theory Y motivations. There was an experiment in which researchers were planning on rewarding monkeys with treats in exchange for solving puzzles. They set the puzzles in the monkey cages and went off to get the treats. When they came back, the monkeys had already solved the problems out of intellectual curiosity and pleasure, not for the treats. Researchers have also found that you can train people out of theory Y motivation. For instance, Many children enjoy coloring and will doodle for hours if left to their own devices with some supplies. However, researchers found that if they attempted to motivate the children to color with eccentric rewards like candy or other treats, the children lost their intrinsic motivation to color and instead did so only in exchange for the extrinsic rewards. As leaders, manage an interview for theory Y traits. Ask what motivates people. Is it the money or is it the opportunity to solve interesting problems? Develop a theory why leadership mindset and expect theory why motivation from your teams and your teams will likely exhibit them. Now let's get really juicy. Let's talk about what a agile transformation is really about. An agile transformation is a little bit like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. A caterpillar cannot imagine what it is like to be a butterfly. Caterpillars cannot tell other caterpillars what it is like to be a butterfly. It is difficult even for a butterfly to articulate what it's like to be them to a caterpillar. Notably, a caterpillar cannot go find another caterpillar selling wings, glue some on, and fly like a butterfly. It is not like that at all. The whole being must commit to the transformation. 
Now from the Caterpillar's perspective, this might be your entire existing project management organization. This may be your entire middle management or even executive management structure. This transformation is going to feel like chaos, perhaps even death. Your way of thinking is going to turn into this liminal goo, and it's not going to look like either a caterpillar or a butterfly for a bit of the process. But if your caterpillar has a good protective cocoon and lets this process gradually unfold, it can indeed emerge as a butterfly. Your organization cannot half commit to its agile transformation. The entire organization, including functions outside of IT, such as finance, human resources, sales, marketing, certainly your entire executive suite, must also commit and change too. The leadership must change the most. I've never seen a butterfly flying around with a caterpillar's head. You're going to need a protective cocoon. In this case, it's the advice and guidance of agile coaches and other leaders who have gone through and led these transformations before. They're going to help you understand the next step and keep your courage up when that liminal goo gets up to your neck. But do not come away thinking that you can delegate any of this to anyone else. After all, this is your transformation and not theirs. So you're probably a leader in your organization if you signed up for this talk. Did you also sign up to lead your agile transformation? If so, what did you suppose that would look like? Here are the things that are going to change in your organization as part of your agile transformation. There are five major things that are going to change. Terminology, tools, process, structure, and culture. Terminology is at one end of the spectrum. Suppose you have business analysts in your organization. A superficial change would have them perform the same role in the same function, but now you're gonna call them product owners. Same goes for your project managers. Maybe you just call them scrum masters now. Or tools, maybe you switch your tools. You've been using Microsoft projects and Gantt charts and your agile coach has said it's time to use Jira. You open up Atlassian Jira, but you're still trying to figure out a way to get Gantt charts out of Jira. Your ways of using the tools are basically the same, they're just new tools. Or process. Maybe now you're using some of the Scrum artifacts like the product backlog or your definition of done or your sprint backlog or your product increment. You're using some of the Scrum events like sprint planning or daily standups, and you're using historical velocity and a pro forma backlog to forecast the future. But you're also managing a lot of dependencies between your back end and your front end teams. Your product owner doesn't have a lot of authority and your human resources department you haven't really figured out how to make the Scrum Master a real role. Now we get into structure. Now you've actually made your product owner a real product owner. They have authority. Your Scrum Master is really a Scrum Master. Perhaps you've gone a step further and you've created cross-functional self-organizing feature teams. You don't need process to manage dependencies because you've worked out of your structure. One defining characteristic of companies are going to make or break their transformation is that scrum masters and agile coaches are a valued role in your organization. Every team has one and they have a meaningful career path. Finally, culture. Your leadership is starting to behave more like Konosuke Masashita and less like Henry Ford. You recognize that your problem is intractably complex and you seek the advice from the people with the most information, the individual contributors on the ground. Continuous improvement and servant leadership is built into your DNA and any opportunity to identify and eliminate waste is celebrated and taken. Here's an example of this. Toyota has 300,000 employees. Those 300,000 employees make a total of 1 million suggestions annually. What percentage of those suggestions do you suppose are implemented? 97%. What do you suppose that organization looks like? Again, that culture. 
As you've probably figured out by now, there's a real spectrum to the value of the transformation. It doesn't buy you much just to change the terminology that you use. As Peter Drucker once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You want to create a culture that develops, attracts, and retains theory why minded talent. You're going to set them up for success with a bold vision, get out of their way, and provide help when asked your team is gonna do the seemingly impossible. And yet, most companies barely improve their process, few change their structure, and even fewer evolve their culture. Why? Because it's hard, slow, and requires leadership involvement. In most, but not all, agile transformations, leaders are too busy or believe themselves to be too important to participate themselves and thus delegate the transformation responsibility to their teams and sometimes coaches. As an agile coach, I sometimes think that I'm a surrogate leader because I'm coming in and I'm helping develop people to their fullest potential, but I truly see this as a requirement of the leaders. William Edwards Deming, a famous lean, friendly management and quality guru, He's regarded as having more impact on Japanese manufacturing and business than anyone not of Japanese heritage. He once said to his CEO, come yourself or send no one. Dr. Deming used to say that 85% and later 95% of problems in any organization were systemic in nature and that management owns all systems. Therefore, management is responsible for 85 to 95 percent of all problems. Most transformations fail because they cannot or will not address the systemic, structural, and cultural problems. What happens is that teams wind up adapting the agile framework Scrum, Kanban, and Lean too soon. This is because they're using tools and processes designed for a structure and culture they do not have. They are not patient enough to sit with that discomfort and see the transformation through. Using those tools and processes to empirically develop that new structure and culture as intended, this is what the tools and processes do. They help you develop your structure and culture. These naive teams adapt the frameworks without understanding them. They adapt the tools and process to the structure and culture they have and can't and won't change, rather than sticking with those tools and process, sitting with that discomfort and using that to evolve the structure and culture. This inhibits their learning and thus they never have a shot at their full potential. Finally, the culture of the organization is limited by the psychosocial maturity of the C-suite and the board. One of the best coaches I've ever worked with studied marriage and family therapy. Can you believe that? Just so they could work with executives. If you don't have a secure, trusting attachment style in your personal relationships, you're not gonna have one with your teams either. It takes a lot of work to get to the point where you can hire people who are smarter than you are and entrust them with your heart's vision. As Matsushita said, the intelligence of very bright technocrats is inadequate to face the challenges of our increasingly complex problems. So you must release this. You must let go. You must develop your maturity to the point where you can say, teams, I've selected you well. I've hired the brightest people that I can. You're all smarter than I am. Here's my vision. Go run with it. Tell me what you need and I will serve you. And so how do I get started? I, I've given you some warnings. I hope to have profoundly disillusioned you as to how easy this transformation is going to be. It's simple. It actually is quite simple, but it's not easy. There's a Zen to it. And so how do we get started? First, approach your transformation one step at a time. I say to my teams, look, if you get together every two weeks for a retrospective, you sincerely get together and you spend 90 minutes just asking yourself, what's going on? How do we get better? You might get two to 3% better every time you do that. Just as Albert Einstein said, there is a magic of compounding interest. 
there is a magic of compounding continuous improvement. If you get two to three percent better every time you retrospect every two weeks, in a year, you're going to be twice as good. It's just this gradual unfolding process. Be patient. Tend to your transformation like a garden and it will blossom. And leaders, please take the time to learn. Read books, take classes, watch videos, execute low risk experiments. I can't tell you how many times I've come in and coach in organizations and leaders have told me to spend days or weeks training their teams, but I can't even get half a day with them to teach them some of the skills they need. And they really do need a full week or two of intensive learning to learn how this transformation is going to shift. Hire reputable coaches with good references and listen to their advice, even if you don't always take it. We've navigated this road. We're Sherpas, we've climbed this mountain, we can help you carry some of the weight and we know where the pitfalls are and we can help you. And lastly, and this is probably the most important piece of advice I can give you. When in doubt about what to do next, take it to your team. Your team is closest to the problem. They understand the problem better than you do. They have the most information. They're most likely to be able to help you solve it. What you bring to the situation is more authority, although you can give them the authority and you have the 10,000 meter view. So they're on the ground in the forest view plus your 10,000 meter view. That comes together to allow you to collaboratively solve the problems. So with that, thank you. That's fantastic, Chris. Um, that, <laughs> in a nutshell, I'm just a bit blown away by your presentation. I really enjoyed it. I think that we all have worked with the X's and understand so, that can relate so much to it, but also sometimes feel that we are somewhere, sometimes caught in the crossroads of some of that when we haven't upskilled ourselves or we've bought into a mindset and really embraced it and then and then you get times like this year when you're that has served you very very badly so i i, I can relate to so much of what you've said um I, i've really enjoyed that that it's it's um and i and i think you must have had some very interesting experiences where you you have seen some businesses that are really with you and then you've walked into some areas where you're like oh my god <laughs> i've been set up to be roasted mm. <laughs> this is <laughs> like you say you're the leader and you've just been set to fix a problem because they understand there is an issue mm. and they've identified they don't have the skills but, but they don't understand how important their leadership is in the process. Mm. Um, I can see how you, you pay the money, you say fix it, um, but you've got to be on for the ride. Um, just a, a couple of questions if I can start off. Uh, is There's a lot of language that goes with what you do and what you talk about and your scrums and your agility. And I see that there is value in what you say for, for pretty much anybody. Um, do you see it as the same? Do you see that, you know, here maybe small to mediums don't access you where they really should? Um, and, and do you see that you get a style of New Zealand company? Mm, that's a great question. Or a type? Yes. So um, I have limited exposure to New Zealand companies at this point, but I, I, I can kind of give you a, a naive perspective. Yeah. And more importantly, I can give you a, a perspective from Silicon Valley. So. You know, we talk about tall poppy syndrome, which it has its advantages at times. So I think it can be an advantage in that if we don't necessarily need to praise individual achievement as much as we can praise team achievement. And there's a real humility. Um, I gave a workshop uh, for an organization called Tato uh, down in Blenheim. And um, he gave me a uh, really beautiful story about the All Blacks. He told me that the players um, are actually responsible for cleaning their own locker room before they go home. And I think that's so powerful mm -hmm. that no matter how high you get in the business domain or in the sports domain, you know, th this, you know the All Blacks, as I understand it, are the second uh, most successful team in history, second only to the, the, the female All Blacks. 
Um, and so to be so profound and so successful, and yet at the end of the day, they still do the work of cleaning their own locker rooms to maintain that humility and maintain that discipline. And I, and I think that this will serve uh, New Zealand businesses very well. And so I think that although Agile is perhaps somewhat newer to New Zealand shores, I think our culture and our ability to learn from those who have come before us will allow us to avoid many of these mistakes. And in Silicon Valley, there is profound hubris. Um, I, I remember walking into a conference room or knocking on the door of a conference room and asking the folks in the conference room to, uh, to evacuate the room so that our team could come in and have our meeting. And they literally said to me, there are more of us than there are of you. Uh, and, and, and this is a way where, you know, we're unable to create psychological safety for our teams. Um, do not look to Silicon Valley as uh, necessarily um, experts in agility. I, I have worked at companies and then I've seen logos for these companies in presentations here in Wellington as examples of highly successful agile companies. <laughs> I just started laughing to myself. But of course, being a consultant, I had to be quiet and I couldn't say very much. So um, I, I actually think we have a, a, a very profound opportunity. And I think the way that we work together in our humility will serve us very well. Fantastic, thank you. Um, in your opinion, when, when you go in to, do you have a view on why transformations tend to fail? Lack of leadership involvement. Um, but um, actually, um, there's some, the organization called Version 1, and they did a state of agile survey, and they've done this for 14 times. So I'll actually share this with you. Uh, they asked people why they fail. There's this general organizational resistance to change or not enough leadership participation, inconsistent processes and practices across teams, which I think is again about leadership failure, organizational culture at odds with agile values, inadequate management support and sponsorship, lack of skills or experience with agile methods. I think that's a failure of leadership to invest, insufficient training and education, same thing. Lack of business, customer, product owner availability. This is the business, this is the executive saying developers go off on their own. Pervasiveness of traditional development methods, that's simply not having the gumption to say, no, really, truly, we're changing. Looking at you know, the top nine or 10 examples, again, it all points back to leadership abdicating their our responsibilities. They say, I want to lead. Well, leadership involves leading. Do you, do you, you said you want to lead the transformation. Here's the opportunity. This is going to require your involvement, certainly more than anybody else's. Have you ever been involved in a transformation where the benefits surprised everybody? Yes. Um, so I was working on a uh, team down in Los Angeles, and I, I, I was working on a project. We were doing a site migration, and I, I use this as an example, and I asked, I would ask various different teams, I would sort of describe to them the type of work that was necessary, um, you know, what were what the scope of work that we were doing. And I would typically ask people, you know, how long would you think this would take? Sort of start to finish, you know, you're not going to have any overtime, uh, you're not going to have any defects, you're not cutting corners. How long do you think this would take? And the most typical response that I got was about four to six months, about six months typically. The team that I worked with completed the scope of work, no downtime, no defects, no overtime, start to finish, three weeks. Mm. And so the best scrum teams in the world are about eight times faster. Imagine being able to do in you know, 12 weeks, what would take you know, your competition two years to accomplish, it's a profound elevation. I mean, I think the example of a caterpillar and a butterfly is actually a very apt metaphor. A caterpillar cannot imagine what it is like to fly and any goofing around with glue on wings will always be a pale comparison to the real thing. Thank you. That's a really, really good example. Thank you. Do you see then that there are some New Zealand, I get, without wishing to raise any heckles in any business <laughs> anywhere, um, you know, like in New Zealand, I guess at the moment, we have lots of construction and infrastructure issues. Mm. Do you see kind of that there is a mentality among those businesses or, or something that 
because we're, we're just, you know, costs are large, costs blow out. Mm. Um, you say you, that with that, with when you get the right people and they work on something together, that perhaps we are sitting in the middle of a, of a, of a lot of businesses that actually need a lot of transformation to help them solve their internal problems to deliver better for everybody else. If you mm. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's funny that you say that because um, there are a lot of people working on large scale projects, uh, including construction, or I know people building out large data centers. So things where they basically say, um, we are, this project is far too big to run using uh, agile or lean mindsets. Um, it's just, we're different, we're special. And uh, if you're one of these people, um, I highly encourage you to look for a talk by a woman named Mary Poppendick. The talk is called The Tyranny of the Plan. And I want to give you an example because I hope this bursts your bubble a little bit. Uh, this is a slide from her presentation talking about the Empire State Building. This is 1929. This is over 90 years ago. And this is before we had computers. They built the Empire State Building exactly on time and 18% under budget. I think that's absolutely extraordinary. And the way that they did that was they actually had very much of a similar agile plan. I'll actually show you the literal plan that they used. They were literally planning floors six through 10 as they were building floors one through five. So here you see information required, right? And this is where they're beginning to do some of their details and delivery. So notice that some of the information required for these top floors, 84 and up, mm -hmm. that's happening down here in April and May when the work on the first few floors has been completely done. The way that they did this was they realized that there were three core constraints for the building. They recognized that first we needed the material movement of 500 trucks worth of you know, concrete and whatnot in and out of busy lower Manhattan every day. They also recognized that they had to get the foundation right. Obviously you can't go back and fix the foundation later. And then as you might expect, the elevator shaft from the bottom floor to the top floor needed to be planned out in a fair amount of detail from the beginning. So what we learned was that it turns out that you know, even for construction projects, we were using lean methodologies uh, a very long time ago, and it was highly successful, and we seem to have forgotten how to do this. Yeah, that's, that is just a brilliant example. I think that, that actually everybody in construction today should be given that geek chart, frankly. Um, because I think it, it, it is, it's, they were lean, they didn't have a whole lot of people, you were building with what you had at the time, and maybe um, our mindset is also overcomplicated matters with a whole lot of people who don't necessarily need to be part of decision making. Um, I think that that's a really, really useful tool, and I've, I've written her name down, I want to go back and read that. Um, in Business Central, we recently did a survey earlier this year, and we found that two thirds of our members were looking at restructures and redundancies. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can see it, it's the reality of life at the moment. Have you got any insights that you could provide for members that are looking at changing the structure of the organization to be more agile in this light of this? Mm -hmm. um, or what they could do to, to try and retain people who are going to be high value, but mm. they at the moment don't know what to do about it? You know, it it's an interesting paradigm and, and a, bit, a bit of a paradox. So Toyota and GM, when they got together and they developed car manufacturing plants together, there's also a beautiful story about a plant called Numi, N-U-M-M-I. And it was part of a radio show called This American Life. They found that when companies adopted these uh, lean practices, that they could develop a higher quality product with a smaller workforce. Um, but I, but I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of a twist here, which I really want to dig into, because I don't want us to think of lean and agile just as an excuse to lower our workforce, or reduce our workforce. Certainly in Silicon Valley, and I presume this is here, also the case in New Zealand as well, it's very difficult to find top quality talent. Um, you know, the, the, the lanes that people go to to hire strong developers in Silicon Valley are extraordinary, and they make 
large amounts of money. And so I think it's less a matter of figuring out how to reduce our workforce, but how to get more value out of the workforce that we have. So our Business Central members might be thinking, okay, I need to you know, reduce the size of my workforce because we don't, we're not productive enough in order to just justify their salaries. But I posit that if you are sincere in this transformation, you may in fact be able to increase the value that you deliver to your customers such that everyone in your company is still indispensable. And so structurally, what I encourage you to do is stop thinking about your functional roles within the organization. Um, there is something called Conway's Law, which is basically the, what the customer sees, the systems that your company will produce reflect your internal organizational structure. So if I have a back-end team and a front-end team and an iOS team and an Android team, those are all gonna be fractioned and my customers are going to experience a disjointed product experience that reflects my internal organization. And I also have to manage a lot of dependencies and so I'm gonna to have to have all these fancy processes and overhead and project managers and business analysts and all these people running around trying to manage this overly complicated machine. People are like babies, not printers. What I mean by that is a printer can only do one thing well, and your job is to keep that printer busy 100% of the time, spitting out printed paper in order to get to do that thing. Babies don't know much at the beginning, but they have this incredible capacity to learn. And so if you say, well, look, I've got my back-end team and my front-end team, and I can't quite create two feature teams because I don't have the immediate skill sets on those teams for these teams to stand alone right from the beginning, that's fine. But when I talk to teams, what I find is that I say, well, how long would it take you to learn the skills necessary to function in this way? And most of the team members that I talk to say, two, maybe four weeks tops? That's no time at all, right? And so the role of a leader is to develop their people to their highest potential. One of the things that I found was really interesting at NUMI, they had an employee team member handbook. And I'll show this to you just because I think it's such a jam and I think it's also kind of along that same line. Here they are, this is a page out of the handbook that gave everyone. They said, we wanna have healthy, sustained growth by fostering high team morale, motivation, your valuable resource and your full involvement in the business is essential to our mutual success. That sounds a lot like Masashita, right? Mm -hmm. But look at their objectives. Their number one objective is to help people develop to their full potential. And they care about continuous employment through all team members through productivity improvements. Notice that their last objective is to build the highest quality car in the world. Mm. Notice how backwards this is compared to the way that most businesses think. But if you get all these other objectives right, if you have full participation, if you have continuous employment, if you have mutual trust, if you recognize worth and dignity, you're gonna develop that theory why mindset and you will develop the highest quality product in the world. Brilliant, that's brilliant. And I think that's just a beautiful thing, um, I guess, Chris, and we're almost coming to the end, is that you can do all of these things if a lot of it you, you think about the people first and you actually take account of what you've got um, and, and they are your employees. But what I get a sense from you as well, it's like, you know, the culture eats strategy for breakfast quote. Yes. Um, we all think strategy, strategy, strategy. <laughs> How are we going to solve these problems? What are we going to do? Um, and and if and I think it's a very New Zealand thing. If you actually put all of that stuff aside and you take it back to basics, we are about people. You know, it's how we've we've gotten this far through COVID, but it's fundamentally why people want to be here and why people love New Zealand. Mm. Um, I think we can do this, and I think sometimes we get a bit bogged down in our business and the doing, and and we. I think this year's been a very good time for us to remember our people. Mm. and to actually treat them a lot kind <laughs> mm. um, and like you say you know we've all had to rock and roll with whatever goes on and and, and it is very 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 important um, and whilst you also have provided a very good framework um the the welsh which i shan't even bother to try like <laughs> i just think that's a really useful tool because i think we can all see at different times in lots of different aspects of our lives we're all doing that um, and it serves us no, no particularly good purpose and certainly not in our business lives. 
Um, but like I said to you earlier, I think some of us, for me, you know, as a 50 year old, I've seen the old, it is, it's a very, it, you have to be committed to your own transformation and what you want to be. And you also have to listen to the people that work for. And just because you did that 10 years ago and that was acceptable, or even maybe six months ago, today that's not, or today actually we've just learned we can do it better. We can communicate in different ways and we can work it out a lot better. And I think, I think New Zealand is a really, really good place for this. Um, I think that we like to adapt and that, that we've really got very, very good about it. Um, and, and I just think I, I've, I've just really enjoyed it. I've loved the theory along with your practical examples. Um, the fact that the Empire State Building was 18% under budget just blows my mind. <laughs> There's a challenge for every New Zealand project today. Um, so you, you're just, for me, Chris, you've been quite inspirational. I've really enjoyed it. I hope way more New Zealand businesses connect with you and we actually get to see a bit more of you in real time onshore, um, delivering, not just, never mind, Silicon Valley. Um, though I'm sure they also need your skills and, um, of course, they will continue to. But you are just such a fantastic asset to have here and it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Mahi. Likewise. Thanks, Chris. Um, so for just for everyone else on the call, we are, this is the end of our third. We have one more session this Thursday and we will have, excuse me for a moment, it is Innovation on Thursday with Randy Commissar and Andrew Phillips. So thank you so much again, Chris Garnier, for joining us for today's session. Thank you, um, Have a fabulous day, everybody. Enjoy the rain.